Hello everyone. Today we shall be looking at the evolution of economics. Now there are various ways in which we can study the evolution of economics. Here in this presentation we shall be doing it by going through the various economic school of thoughts that have come about over the given period of time. Now there are a lot of theories and school of thoughts in economics. And sometimes it can be confusing as well as, as well as hard to remember. Also, one can question the rationale as to why there are really so many of them. So we shall, in this presentation, we shall look to answer some of these questions. Also, we shall try to summarize and simplify the various economic school of thoughts. So what are the reasons for so many theories and economic school of thoughts? To start with, there are five critical factors that affect the economic outcomes. They are productivity, demand, supply, money and trade. And they are not in any order as such. The combination of these factors in varying degrees and under various circumstances it is what really affects the economic outcomes. Also, it is important to note that these factors are themselves autocorrelated, thus increasing the scope and complexities uh, of economics as a field of study as well as for some even the fun. So there are several possible combinations of these factors. At a given point of time, there can be several possible economic outcomes and hence there is the reason for so many economic theories and school of thoughts. A combin also to note, important to note is that a combination of all these factors together is what ultimately influence the business cycle which is what many macroeconomic economists are interested in studying. Also like any other field of study or knowledge for that matter, economics has also been evolving over a period of time. So as more information, more empirical evidence comes in the new theories get developed in economics. And unlike in hard sciences like physics or chemistry, the economic setup also keeps on changing over a given period of time, leading to evolution of new theories or school of thoughts. Now, by that what I mean. So for example, pre-1970s was the era of hard or at least semi-hard currency. Now we are in the period of credit based and fiat monetary system. And hence, obviously, when money is very critical factor in economics, a change in the complete setup of money changes the economic theories. Even, there, even the technological changes that we witnessed that led to increased globalization and hence international trade, especially between developed and developing countries, altogether change the context and hence was responsible for changes in economic theories themselves. So how to remember so many theories and economic school of thoughts? Now remember the five factors that I talked about in the previous to previous slide? Think of the economic outcomes within the parameters of those five factors and how changes in one factor can lead to changes in other factors and together how they influence the economic outcomes. I think that is what is more important then remembering the various theories as well as economic school of thoughts. But that's again my personal opinion. However, it's important that we know about the economic school of thoughts and the evolution of economics. That enhances our economic understanding and makes it make the whole subject interesting as well. So let me give an example of how changes in the economic setup can lead to a to a need of a new theory or an economic school of thought. So in, an, in the old economic setup, when the government of a developed country, let's say, used to increase the fiscal deficit, the growth in terms of GDP used to increase because of the increase in demand. And the increase in demand used to lead to an increase in supply and hence economic growth. However, due to changes in technology and the increased globalization, that has led to 
ever increasing international trade between developed and developing countries. This actually now means this by this I mean that change in the increase in the fiscal deficit means that the supply increases not in the domestic country but in the foreign country in this case the developing country and has the a larger share of growth increase happens in the developing country because of that and at the same time if in earlier times when the increase in fiscal deficit stands for any central bank monetization used to happen it used to lead to an increase in interest rates however now that increase is far less the reason because the exporter nation piles on the debt or buys the debt of the developed nation to keep its currency stable so basically we observe that the same economic forces now provide a different outcome or an outcome with de with decrease efficacy and this results in the need for new theories which can eventually develop into complete school of thoughts so let's start a journey and study the various modern economic school of thoughts that have developed over a period of time however economics commerce has been an area that has that is as old as perhaps mankind itself and so there have been great economic thinkers in the past as well one of them who had lived about 2500 years back was a great indian economic and political thinker by the name of kautilya also called chanakya who wrote an extensive political and economic treatise by the name of arthashastra where he laid out a pretty modern economic vision at that point of time and being this as an example there have been such thinkers in various civilizations however in this present presentation we shall be discussing the timeline of modern economic school of thoughts that started developing somewhere in 18th century mainly in the western world so modern economics pretty much started from the gentleman called adam smith when he wrote his book wealth of nations some other economics like ricardo contributed to it and this together is called as classical economics so classical economics is the earliest modern school of thought in economics the basic tenets that classical economics lies upon are free markets that is non government intervention laissez faire and the concept of invisible hand laid down by adam smith major ideologues and proponents include adam smith and david ricardo who gave the principle of comparative advantage uh, the the primary economic parameters that this school of thought focuses upon is supply according to classical economics the prices are determined by the cost of goods that is cost of goods plus x percentage over that uh, essentially relying upon the labor theory of value now after classical economics the the economic school of thought that came was called the neo classical school of economics major proponents include alfred marshall leon walras so again neo classical school of economics evolved from the classical school of economics the basic tenets of free markets remained in neo classical school of economics however neo classical school of economics introduced a lot of vigor over the classical school of economics again major proponents include leon walras alfred marshall and karl menger now karl menger was also the bridge from class from neo classical economics to another school of economics that we shall come very shortly focus of class neo classical school of economics was on supply and demand that is on a, in other words exchange unlike classical school of economics according to neo classical school of economics the prices were determined not by the cost of goods but by the equilibrium achieved through supply and demand it also introduced the concepts of marginal utility so in other words you can call classical or the neo classical school of economics as a highly updated version of 
classical school of economics. So in parallel to the neoclassical school of economics developed another school of economics which was the Marxist school of economics by Karl Marx. Marx now Marxist school of economics as I said before developed parallel to neoclassical school of economics. The basic tenets unlike the classical and neoclassical school of economics in the Marxist school of economics was of collectivism and state control and intervention. The major ideologue proponent of this is Karl Marx. The focus of Marxist school of economics primarily was on supply. It propagated building a classless society, state intervention and control over factors of production and the factors of production themselves should collectively share the fruits of economic outputs rather than giving it to a few people who own them and they themselves distributing some of that to the laborers in form of wages and bonuses etc. Now after these three school of thoughts I would draw a line and right at this line comes the fourth school of thought called Austrian school of thought. Now below this line essentially are the microeconomic school of thoughts. Austrian school of thought doesn't really consider itself as micro below this line or macro which is essentially above this line. It rather says that the distinction between micro and macroeconomics is a futile distinction as the economic thought should be safe for micro as well as on an aggregate level for macro. So that's why we have put it at the border. And hence keeping that in line or that, that in mind, I would say below this line are the economic school of thoughts uh, on a micro level and above this line are economic school of thoughts that deal with business cycles more appropriately. Austrian school of thought is also one of them. The main proponents were Karl Menger who provided the link from neoclassical to Austrian and then Frederick Hayek and Ludwig von Mises. So the Austrian school of thought evolved from the neoclassical school of thought. The basic tenet of Austrian school of thought is same, is, is same as that of free markets. However, it's even more stringently propagated. Major ideologues include Karl Menger, Ludwig von Mises and Frederick Hayek. Austrian school of thought focuses on business cycle. That is, it takes all the major five parameters of economics into cognizance. However, it has more focus on money and productivity. Prices, according to Austrian school of thought, is determined by the value of goods that the consumer is willing to give it. And hence, the costs also eventually are determined by that. So unlike, unlike in the classical and neoclassical school of thought, where in classical school of thought the prices are determined by the cost of the inputs and the neoclassical school of thought where prices of goods are determined by the equilibrium of supply and demand. Austrian school of thought says the prices of goods are determined by the value given by the consumer and the costs, actually the costs, unlike what classical economics says, the costs flow from, the, from that value given by the consumer to that good. Also, it says that over a period of time, the government intervention are actually negative, negative to the economic growth outcome. Austrian school of thought also rejects any, determin any deterministic models of in economics and consider the distinction between macro and microeconomics as futile. So following Austrian economics, the concepts of free markets non-government intervention in economy started to get, gain further steam, especially in the Western world. And following this came about the next school of thought, which was the Schumpeterian school of thought, propagated by Joseph Schumpeter from Germany. So in this school of thought, this school of thought essentially developed, evolved from the Austrian economic school of thought. The basic tenets include innovation and entrepreneurship. Major ideologue was Joseph Schumpeter. 
It focused like Austrian economics on business cycle, but with critical emphasis on productivity and supply. So essentially this school of thought opened up the idea of how productivity is a critical input in economic growth. This school of thought was a late, late boomer as well. Uh, it definitely gained traction in earlier times, but specifically in, in 1970s when the world entered into the era of stagflation, Schumpeterian school of thought also gained traction. Um, it advocates uh, providing an environment that can increase productivity, entrepreneurship and technical innovations, which would ultimately increase the supply. And it's really the increase in supply according to this school of thought, which leads to economic growth and prosperity. It also extends the business cycle from typically credit cycle that Austrian school of thought focused upon and advanced it to technological changes, changes in idea or generation changes and floated the much popular term of, of creative destruction. In, now, in the 20th century came a very big economic event which was called the Great Depression. These existing economic school of thoughts could not explain or even solve the issues that evolved in the Great Depression. And so came a new school of thought, which was evolved from the neoclassical and partly with, tang with tangential link to the Marxist school of thought and came to be known as a Keynesian school of thought, developed by uh, the economist John Meyer Keynes. Now, as seen, it evolved from neoclassical and Marxist school of thoughts. The basic tenets, unlike other school of thoughts, which uh, propagated free markets, non-government intervention, this school of thought actually advocated government intervention through fiscal spending to revive the demand in the economy. The major ideologue proponent, as you see, as you have seen, was John Mayer Keynes. Uh, the economic, again, this was a business cycle um, economic school of thought, but its main focus was on demand and money, unlike the previous ones which, which focused on supply. Uh, it started to it gained traction because of the 29, 29 Great Depression when supply and demand didn't find the best possible equilibrium point that neoclassical and its offshoots tried to propagate. It also brought about the concept of macroeconomics into fray wherein we deal with demand, supply and prices on an aggregate level and focused on providing the full employment. Unlike Austrian economics, it advocated deterministic models, government intervention, as it says the market sometimes did not self-correct itself and finds the right equilibrium points. Now, after Keynesian school of thought, in 1970s came another significant event in economics and not just event, a very big change, structural change happened in the world of economics. We moved from an era of hard or what we can say semi-hard uh, currency, which was essentially gold standard, to a fiat and credit based money. And this apart from some, geopol and apart from some geopolitical events and wrong economic policies that emanated from economic school of thoughts at that time led the world into an era of stagflation. To answer that situation came a new school of thought called the monetaristic school of thought. This school of thought emanated from neoclassical and a tangential link to the Austrian school of economics. Main proponent being Milton Friedman. So monetarist economics evolved from neoclassical and Austrian economics. The basic tenet of free market was back in fashion that went away after Keynesian economics. However, unlike Austrian and um, neoclassical economics, this one emphasized upon uh, intervention through monetary policy route. So not completely free markets as such. And this monetary policy 
intervention it says is necessary to achieve stable economic growth that is economic growth uh, or full employment with control of stable inflation the major ideologue was milton friedman uh, again this was a business cycle economics which focused on this time on supply and money uh, it gained traction post the 1970s stagflation uh, when it came into four as the also the world as we discussed in the previous slide the when the world shifted from a gold or semi gold based standard to into a fiat and credit based monetary standard now this theory like the keynesian theory also accepts the deterministic models in economics specifically related to money growth and inflation for example the quantity theory of money models now during the times when monetarist economics came into cognizance a small offshoot of austrian and schumpeterian economics also came about into fashion called the supply side economics uh, by art laffer uh, now this is this was a small offshoot uh, of out of austrian and schumpeterian economics uh, when it came into fashion due to the 1970s stagflation decade mm, basic tenets it took from austrian economics uh, pointing out to the limitations of the government interventions it says that uh, one should have low taxes regulations and hence boost the supply this boosting of supply would lower inflation and hence will also lead to growth so in effect promotes it promoted growth and stability in terms of inflation major ideologue was art laffer uh, the major economic parameter it emphasized upon was supply it was it was not really a complete business cycle economics as such it advocates that supply of goods and services is the critical driver of economic growth over demand which was important but secondary and so it advocated reduce reduction reduction in taxes especially the corporate taxes regular reduced reduction in regulations to boost the supply and in a sense the growth and it also said this increasing growth would also lead to lowering of inflation now as we moved into late 80s when stagflation had went away globalization had started kicking in new monetary system uh, which was credit and fiat based had taken over uh, the monetary school of thought or the keynesian school of thought in itself were insufficient to determine what was happening in the world of economics and so combining these two school of thoughts is what came about and what is known as the new keynesian school of thought or neo keynesian school of thought of economics uh, the main proponents are paul krugman joseph stiglitz now this school of thought evolved from the keynesian and monetarist economic school of thoughts and also i must add is currently the most popular model or school of thought in the world of economics again takes tenets both from keynesian and monetarist viewpoints uh, major ideologues as we saw paul krugman and joseph stiglitz uh, again this is a business cycle economics with focus on demand supply and money uh, it gained traction post the 1980s now this also advocates deterministic models government intervention focuses on growth with price stability over the standard keynesian aim of full employment now apart from new keynesian economics came about a relatively new economic school of thought called the behavioral economic school of thought uh, the proponents are robert shiller daniel kahneman now this school of thought is relatively new it has taken some tenets from new keynesian economics but also added uh, and which it focuses upon the behavior of market participants and it says that in a sense understanding that understanding the market behavior and market expectations can give the recipe for ideal policy response uh, major ideologues are richard thaler richard shiller daniel kahneman um, it's again not a complete business cycle theory uh, and it doesn't focus on some specific uh, parameters but on human behavior 
to various economic actions like stimulus, taxes, etc. Again, relatively new field of study, and at it it also advocates government intervention at times, but it has floated many theories on behaviors and expectations of market participants like prospect theory, etc., to analyze human behavior to those market interventions by the government or central bank authorities, for example. Now, after that, one of the latest school of thoughts is the post-Keynesian school of thought, under which comes the MMT or modern monetary theory. Uh, major proponents are Randall Ray, Stephanie Kelton. Now, this school of thought evolved from the Keynesian and monetarist school of thoughts or the neo-Keynesian school of thought. Uh, major ideologues are Randall Ray, Stephanie Kelton. Uh, again, this is a business cycle economics with focus on demand, supply and money. Now, this theory came into fore and gained traction post the 2008 financial crisis that actually showed the limitations of the traditional economic theories that is floated by uh, Milton Friedman, Keynes or even the neo-Keynesian neo theory due to changes in two big factors which are credit and fiat based money impact and the increased globalization. This theory advocates government and central bank uh, intervention and in fact goes on to say that they have far greater, greater scope to intervene via fiscal and monetary stimulus to achieve growth that is full employment but equally stresses on price stability as well and considers price stability as a barometer to check the level of intervention of government or central banks. It also lays down a fundamentally uh, different concept of taxes in which taxes are to be viewed in the current system. However, it's silent on another critical concept of economics which is productivity. Now, also apart from this, we have something called as developmental economics. Now, this economics has been around for quite some time. It's an old stream of economics. It takes point of views from both macro and microeconomics. Uh, major ideologues are many, in fact, say, like Albert Hirschman, Walt Rostow. The economic parameters it focuses on, again, as I said, both micro and macro, um, it especially focuses on supply and money and productivity as well in the macro side of things. It has been around for a long time. On the macro side, it looks for growth in supply using improved productivity, monetary policies and government stimulus. On the micro side, it looks at social welfare aspects like distribution and creation of public goods in the area of healthcare, education, etc. Now, another small school of thought is the institutional school of thought in economics. Uh, this has been around since 1920s. Uh, its main focus is on the role of various institutions in shaping and changing of various economic aspects and behavior of the economic participants. It thus focuses on interactions between institutions and economic participants, as well as how changes in these institutions in turn affect these interactions, economic behaviors, and economic outcomes. Thorstein Weblin laid the foundation of this economic school of thought. So this is how economic school of thoughts or economic theories have evolved over the period of time. So what from here? How this evolution will shape up in the coming years? What more theories or economic school of thought can we see in the future? Now, any economic theory is required once there is a major change in the economic setup. So are we seeing such a change? Well, two components of those five that we discussed initially in our presentation are witnessing some changes. With the, these components are money and globalization. 
by globalization I mean trade. Now with the onset of digital money like Bitcoin, the question comes, is the sovereign monopoly over money going to decline or completely go away? Now if that were to happen, it will be a big change in economics and may require a new theory or economic school of thought to come about. Also, we have seen the trend towards increased nationalism and decline in globalism or globalization, which leads to uh, lower trade, lower commerce, lower, lower international interactions. This is because the marginal economic returns from globalization are now turning negative. So, as we discussed, changes in any of these structural changes in the various economic parameters may require a new economic theory or a school of thought. And so changes in these two of the five critical economic parameters can in the future shift this economic narrative and get set the need for a new economic theory or model to explain the new paradigm that we are about to enter into. And so thank you very much for watching this presentation. Do subscribe if you like such content and comment in case of any queries. Thanks a lot.